Welcome to Health Tech Matters, a podcast brought to you by the Pankhurst Institute at the University of Manchester. I'm your host, Videya Sharma. In the next episode, we talk about team science and the importance of interdisciplinary working when developing new health technologies. We started to recognise the importance of all sorts of different people that make digital health happen. And they can be quite invisible at the end product, but absolutely integral to what was developed. So we started to create an environment where those people could flourish. We're joined by Ruth Norris and Charlie stockton Powdrell. Hi, Ruth and Charlie. It's great to have you here this morning. Good to see you, Videa. Yeah, hi, Videa. Thanks for having us. No, thank you for joining us. So I want to start by talking a little bit about your backgrounds. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journeys. You both come from very different backgrounds. However, you've obviously coalesced around the theory of team science. I'd love to hear a bit about how that collaboration came about and how you got to the place where you are today. Okay, yeah, so I'm Ruth. I had a bit of a journey getting here. Uh, It's the place I realise now that I always wanted to be. I just didn't know digital health or team science existed, and it turns out they do. So um, I have a background in cognitive science from a um, a training point of view, did my undergraduate in that, and then uh, came up to Manchester to do a master's degree, uh, fell into some work in financial services, worked in that for 10 years, doing programme management, transformation, change management, and then felt like I wanted to do something a bit different and moved to the university and started to use those transferable skills for digital health project management Um, and through that journey we found out about something called team science um, and that's why we've come to talk to you today about that. Great and how about you Charlie? So I um, have a background in um, human resources and recruitment um, and went to university a little bit later in life to study psychology And I never wanted to work in research because I thought it's all about statistics and that wasn't what interested me or floated my boat. Um, And so I started working as a research assistant in health psychology just before I graduated. And then I've worked in health research ever since and with a digital health focus for the last eight to nine years. Um, And I think there are probably things from before my research career that have helped with the way I work now. So I guess bringing some sort of diversity and some different experiences to working in health research have helped Um, some experience in the NHS, which I think is quite valuable for working so closely with our NHS colleagues. Um, And I think, as Ruth said, um, you know, it's about that sort of diversity of background, um, bringing together different disciplines and different experiences to help enrich the sort of team science approach to research. Brilliant. I mean, that sounds absolutely fascinating to bring backgrounds from industry as well as from frontline healthcare and bringing those into the digital health academic space. People might say, as academics, we all work in teams anyway. We work with collaborators across disciplines and um, papers are always written by multiple authors. It's never a one, um, one player game. But can you tell us a little bit more about what team science then exactly is and how that is supposed to enrich um, the way we do research? Sure. So team science is a huge area and the way that it's applied will depend on the domain, the organisation, etc. and what's needed from a project. But in, in our world, one of the key ways in, in which we feel we've made a difference is around recognising the role of non-academics in research. So health informatics, by its very nature, is a very multi- has to be a very multidisciplinary activity. Health informaticians really need to work with a clinician, they need to work with a statistician, etc. So it's really a very, very sensible place to have team science. I don't think you get very far if you if you if you use the traditional model. So we started to recognise the importance of these different sp- skill specialists. So we've got digital software engineers, we've got bioinformaticians, we've got um, public engagement, communications, project management. IT specialists, dev DevOps managers, all sorts of different people that make digital health happen. And they can be quite invisible at the end product, but absolutely integral to what was developed. So um, we started to help to create an environment where those people could flourish and really show and add the value that their experience can give. Also, on an individual level, a lot of people have a background that could 
add something that you don't know about. So we have a software engineer in our group who is an incredible uh, developer, but he also has an experience um, as a nurse on the front line. It's beautifully applied in what he um, codes. And also he's a gaming enthusiast, and that led to hospital simulation so it's a game where you simulate a hospital environment and pick people into roles and people can really see what it's like to work in hospital um and that's something that we've we developed with our director of our center george moulton uh, for training and so you've got three different life experiences coming together in one role um so by letting that person be blurry by letting them be open and using all their different skills you get to bring that that extra energy and that extra value. Fantastic. I absolutely love that example. And I also love the term blurry. I think it's all about trying to blur the lines between, not just between different disciplines, but also between the different skills that individuals bring into the team. So, Charlie, thinking about um, what Ruth said around incentives and around rewarding those that contribute to academic research but may not be perhaps motivated by the same traditional accolades as academics, i.e. published papers or research grants. How can we motivate these to work in science or, or academia and indeed contribute as Ruth has described? I think that's a really good question and I think it's something we've been thinking about. So Ruth and I are both um, professional services staff, so we're not academics. And I think we and our other skilled specialist colleagues um, add a lot to the research um, outputs that we work on. Um, and as Ruth had said, there are lots of different roles that underpin and support research that are often unseen and unrecognised. Um, we have the opportunity, I think we're fortunate to have the opportunity with the teams we work in to um, provide different contributions and have recognition in different ways. So some of those may be contributing to papers, some of those may be opportunities to present at international conferences, which Ruth and I both have experience of, which is which is really exciting. And we're delighted to tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, and I think just having that conversation with people and saying you know what motivates you what encourages you what do you value in terms of recognition what's important to you and for some people that will be um, career opportunities or development opportunities for some people it's simply the recognition of people saying thank you you've done a great job um, and there are lots of different um, ways in which you can recognize people within the university so there are different awards that people can be nominated for and I think it really is just about um having that conversation and letting people know how valuable their contribution is and recognising that outside the traditional academic world that, that we're, we're kind of on the edge of, if you like. Great. And I, we know that it's difficult to attract and retain high quality individuals these days, not just in academia or on, as you say, the edges of academia, but across industries. So I wonder whether you've got a thought around working in digital health specifically, which is, of course, revolving around patients and citizens and how we can enhance their care or their life experience. Perhaps there is a potential for that to be an additional motivator for individuals to come in, work in these these teams. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, certainly for me and people that I know in the space where we work, um, different types of recognition are really key. So a university can't necessarily match some industry salary uh, scales however there can be a freedom in academia that is really desirable for a lot of people however in professional services or the skill specialist space that that decreases somewhat so if we can make that more open give people these opportunities to really express themselves and bring this value then that may well be a retention factor for a lot of people I'd say it was for me um, and there's other examples like the um, the data saves lives campaign which started off in a communications team somebody just had an idea saying we just need to get this message out there that digital health is important and that data safely used well governed reused can really have a benefit and that was not it was not something specified in our funding it was not something that we were funded to do per se but by funding a communications and project management hub as part of a program that we were funded by a medical research council we created something that didn't exist before that nobody knew that we needed and it has 
grown and be- created as something completely different and it's now its own entity it has its own hashtag it has its own twitter account uh, mps and uh, lords have um, signed up to the campaign and wear the badge with pride and also there are a number of uh, government strategies and documentation which use this title now so nobody knew we needed that right um, somebody came in to come and do the comms for our center and just blew it out of the water so um, I've completely forgotten what the question was but I was excited to share that with you <laughs> No, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. And I think that comes back to what Charlie was saying earlier about recognising those teams that perhaps sit slightly more on the edge of traditional academic models. And do you think over the years you're seeing that there is a greater recognition of that? It's certainly in, in my experience, I wonder whether the role for communicating our academic outputs, which are traditionally uh, written with lots of jargon, that are written in certain styles, that are not very accessible, that are not very inclusive, means that the value of that research, perhaps the wider public domain, is lost. And do you think this is where elements of what you've talked about need to be mainstreamed within academia? Yeah, so I think there are still lots of academic outputs that are being produced from the research we do but also we're trying to think about different ways to communicate our research and to engage with uh, communities with with the public one of those ways is um, we've engaged the contact theatre to do some work for us so for a particular project that I worked on we had some artists who would telephone people who had taken part in the project they would ask them various questions and they would ask them to move around their house and to engage with everyday objects within their house and then an artist at the other end of the telephone would draw or sketch out um, something that visualised the experience and that was a really unique and novel way of engaging with and producing outputs from research and I know that a, a big project that Ruth worked on the Connected Health Cities programme had an orchestral musical output where it was very theatrical there were composers who had written particular pieces of music for particular outputs and again that's something that is getting people to think very differently and sort of diversely about ways in which we can engage people and ways in which we can share the outputs of our research. Yeah, I think that's right and I think when when these things are given the space to flourish they are well regarded. What one of the challenges is sometimes the way that in which research is funded doesn't necessarily allow the space for certain roles or um resources to be included when you know you, you've got you've got an objective we've got to meet that objective and move on to the next thing it's sometimes hard to for people to recognize the value of investing in some of these extra things like public engagement communications project management um, IT they all just seem like costs and not value and it's helping people to show the examples of where those things have made a massive difference and helping funders to fund things in different ways so that we can we can really start to make those changes. And I think to add to what you've just said there, Ruth, some of that funding needs to either come from core infrastructure funding, so these 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 calls need to be made available, or there needs to be some infrastructure funding that can be made available through research grants. So we have had some infrastructure funding in the past for the Healthy Research Centre and for Connected Health Cities. And that was crucial in terms of funding communication roles, um, project management roles, operations roles. And some of those are more difficult to fund subsequently since that infrastructure funding has ended and we're looking at research funding. And that's a challenge that we're facing constantly. And we're trying to um, retain good, excellent staff, in fact, through research funding, which is sometimes a little tricky. This podcast is brought to you by the Christopher Penkus Institute at the University of Manchester. It's a partnership between the University of Manchester and the NHS, public sector and industry. Our mission is to make positive change in health and care for all through multidisciplinary and collaborative development, evaluation and implementation of new health technologies. So picking up on that, I wonder, do you have any tips or advice for anybody out there in a different academic institute who might want to engage their leadership or their senior stakeholders with regards to some of these points and how do you think they'd be able to I guess make the case for team science and this wider infrastructure based funding? There's a few different ways I guess but it's kind of taken the moment to really think about 
of what you're do what you're doing. It's a bit like somebody says, "What do you do for your job?" I'm not really sure, and you, you re- you're too close to it. You don't realise what you're doing all the time. Um, so I think if they did maybe an audit or you know, got somebody in to just assess what they're doing um, in the team space or went to a conference about teams and started to recognise, because that's exactly what happened to us. So we had a, some investment from the university called Investing in Success, to um, which paid for uh, myself and a couple of colleagues to attend a conference in the States where team science is much bigger. They have huge National Institute for Health um, grants. They're absolutely massive. So the way that teams work there in there is absolutely key. So they have a lot more background so we went to this conference and um, found out team science is a thing we just went to talk about how we'd use specialisms of communications project management um, and public engagement PPIE Um, and we found out that you know what we were doing was real it was part of a proper theoretical movement you know it's a domain there's lots of lots of things to learn so I think people probably just need to take a moment to see where they're doing it already show the value, maybe try to write a paper about that or to get the academic buy-in, um, try to increase the retention of people in those roles and maybe go to some of these conferences where they can start to get more tools and knowledge and uh, things they can bring back to their practice. Yeah, I think that's great, Ruth. And um, you talked about publications about team science as well. So I, I managed a project called the Wearable Clinic a few years ago now, which was... Um, a project that involved um, colleagues from computing science, um, software development, electrical engineering and health informatics. And it was very much a a team science approach. And um, one of my colleagues, Matt Machin, is leading on a team science paper to talk about our experiences of how we applied a team science methodology to our working and ways in which we managed to sort of make the most out of the interdisciplinary working and the, the value and contribution that everybody made. Um, and I think also it's it's really important you talked about um, how you can potentially get support from your university. And I think we're very lucky because Professor Nigel Hooper, who's the Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Manchester, um, and Professor Colette Fagan, the Vice President for Research, um, Ruth and I are actually meeting with them next week because um, Nigel supported and funded a subsequent trip to the Science of Team Science conference that Ruth and I and a couple of others attended. And Nigel is really keen for us to be involved in the implementation and rollout of team science at the University of Manchester. So I think there are some really exciting opportunities um, coming up in the future. Great, fantastic. I think from what you're saying, um, both of you, I wonder whether perhaps lots of places are already doing team science or perhaps part of it. Mm -hmm. They A, may not realise that and B, they haven't had the opportunity to formalise that And there is value in that formalization in terms of recognition, in terms of potential funding, in terms of potential research outputs. So you mentioned that in the US there, this is more commonplace um, and and things are perhaps perhaps a bit more advanced. Could you tell us a few examples from your experience at the conference or other examples that you've heard of? I went to a really good workshop at the 2018 conference um, run by somebody called Andy Hess which was all about interdisciplinary translation, which looked at how do projects where many very different domains are working together make sure that they all are hearing the same thing from one another. Um, It's a bigger problem than you might think. So there's things like, for example, if I said to you, um, MVP, Videa, what would you interpret that as? I would think minimally viable product. Yes, that is one interpretation. In America, they all said, what? The first thing we'd all thought, think of there would be most valuable player. So, you know, that that happens all the time. There's lots of terms and statistics and different fields that mean just, it's not that they don't know them. More dangerously, they do know them, but they mean something else. Um, so the argument in this workshop was about um, having somebody, like a project manager, some sort of facilitator to unpick that sort of see it happening um, test assumptions keep people on the you know have dictionaries have all those good things ask the stu- what seem like the stupid questions what does that mean because 
quite possibly different people think it means different things so we had a really really good workshop about that there so um, we actually invited Andy to come to the university and repeat that and we had people from uh, right across the university all come to that and they absolutely loved it so um, that would be something that I really learned about would be interdisciplinary translation. Great that's a really really good example and I love that because the question I wanted to come on to next was working with clinicians and healthcare professionals. And this is certainly something that we have experience of um, even within different medical domains. At medical school, I remember there was always this example given when in the notes, someone would say, oh, blood test X, Y, and Z, NAD. And NAD, people thought, would stand for no abnormality detected. But an alternative NAD could be not actually done which, of course, means something very different to know I'm normally detected when it comes to test results. So I completely hear you when you're talking about translation between disciplines. So what, how, how have you found working with healthcare professionals and clinicians, especially, as we all know, the health service is under tremendous pressure and frontline staff are, of course, um, time poor. They do not have perhaps the um, capacity to work with academic teams or research teams what's your experience been like over the last few years of that yeah it certainly can be tricky and uh, naturally clinicians have a focus on um, patient health and and, um, providing um, the right kind of clinical support for patients Um, and that's as it should be and we have found sometimes that we've had clinicians who we've been collaborating with on a project who have um, found it difficult to commit the time that we'd like them to or that they'd like to to the project One of the ways we've tried to overcome that is by um, perhaps sometimes engaging a couple of different clinicians from a particular specialty, um, and that also provides different perspectives as well. Um, We have found that sometimes engaging with the clinical academic can be quite useful because they have that invested academic and research interest. And sometimes actually just finding a really enthusiastic doctor who is is really passionate and interested in your area of research to engage with. Um, and that can be quite useful as well. I don't know if it's fair to say that junior doctors may have may have less administrative responsibilities. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that they have much more time. It's probably fair to say. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. It's something that I often wonder about. Um, I think traditionally in research, as well as perhaps with industry partners, there is an attraction to engage perhaps more senior uh, clinicians um, across the board from nurses, physios, medics. But actually, with regards to gaining real world insights of what it's like to be on the shop floor, what it's like to be interacting with patients, I often think there's actually a lot of value in engaging the, the ward nurse rather than the matron or engaging the foundation doctor rather than the senior registrar or the consultant Uh, and similarly typically whenever we think of digital health there is a focus often on doctors or clinical academics however I wonder whether there is a lot of value in speaking to non-doctor healthcare professionals have you guys had any experience of that yeah that's um that's a really good point and I think there's I mean it's not necessarily allied health professionals but people like practice managers um you know, can be a really important uh, gatekeeper in relationship with the GPs or um, and helping to win hearts and minds, perhaps, um, and access things. So hierarchy isn't always helpful in working out who the best people might be to be involved in something. Yeah, we do quite a lot of work in digital mental health. And so we work very closely with care coordinators who are not doctors, but who are um, really key clinical staff um, who work very closely with patients and service users um, and their input is always extremely valuable um, particularly those who have an interest in digital mental health but also those who aren't as interested because sometimes they can add a dimension that you haven't thought about or they can make you aware of some challenges or some barriers that are really important to overcome so I think engaging more broadly with the clinical teams as you suggested is really quite important and really valuable. Medea? Can I ask you a question? Of course. Excellent. Um, So what's your experience of team science? And honestly, we'd really like to know. So do you think as a researcher, medic, all good things, that the team science model 
has had any impact, positive or negative impact on you or yeah just just your thoughts would be really interesting yeah thanks for asking me to share um so listen i think for, for me personally i'm completely bought in to the idea and that's because i've personally had tremendous positive experience of working with designers developers project managers who have not just added value to my projects but have also taught me a lot so my growth and development during my phd was largely due to my interactions with these individuals across disciplines having a new way of thinking a new perspective or being able to appreciate what we talked about earlier translating between different teams is super valuable and i wonder whether as a clinical academic or as someone who is perhaps in a leadership position there is tremendous value in having that experience and being able to be that person who says well you're saying mvp but i'm really sorry but what does that actually mean and if you are the person who is supposedly in a leadership position and has the uh, i guess humility or displays that humility to be able to do that that permeates through the whole team right so um for me that's something that has been tremendously valuable and i've loved it you know i've learned how to design i've learned how to make prototypes i've learned how to run user workshops and all these skills that i otherwise would never have picked up from a traditional academic phd where i was just focused on research you know traditional research methods and also to add to that i wonder whether this is something that we need to learn in academia generally from team science but also perhaps from other industries where people work in far more agile iterative ways and bring that kind of way of thinking that kind of way of working into academia and you do that by having what we just started off talking about today right you've worked in industry charlie you worked in other places and that makes a real difference you bring that knowledge that experience into the academic field and cause a you know disruption or cause a new way of thinking and i think that's super valuable and we need a lot more of that we need grit in the oyster we need more constructive disruptors perfect thanks so much and thanks for asking me that so what's next on the horizon for you guys have you guys got any further projects planned any plans to try to expand this idea i'd love to hear more about what's next So we've got the International Centre for Translational Digital Health, um, which I'm the programme manager for. And that's a collaboration between the universities of Manchester, Toronto and Melbourne. And it's very much an interdisciplinary or team science um, collaboration between the three universities, which brings together leaders in digital health, computing science, um, health policy and implementation, brings people together to try and find ways in which we can collaborate more internationally share the knowledge that we have between us, look at filling any gaps that we may have in our own centres um, and really try to create a sort of world leading um, centre for translating digital technologies into the healthcare system. Um, we're just over a year old now and we're looking to uh, to develop things further and to introduce a joint PhD programme um, and I think there'll be really exciting things to come from the International Centre. And that International Centre is obviously part of the Pankhurst Institute, which runs these podcasts. Um, I'm the operations manager for the Pankhurst, and our aim is to create an environment for industry partners, NHS partners and uh, allied services and providers and academic or institutions, including all the skill specialists, to come together in working in an agile way to move technology along the translation pipeline so we're going to be having a whole series of different workshops so just as you were saying agile is going to be really key in the Pankhurst it's something that the university isn't necessarily used to doing but it's something that we are used to doing in digital health so we're going to apply that to the Pankhurst strategic objectives. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing those future visions. And thank you so much for joining us today. I absolutely loved hearing your views and perspectives. And also thanks for asking me a question. That's not happened before. You're welcome. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Vidaya. In the next episode, we talk about the role of technology to support the physical health for patients suffering with mental illness. We'll be joined by Dr. Joe Firth, who is a leading expert in this field. So I hope you can join us.